Chapter 2. A Hostile Environment Liz is the Grinch who wants to stop Christmas. That was the response in Cabinet from Michael Gove, the Environment Secretary, to my 11th hour attempts to ditch COP26, the UN climate change conference that the UK was bidding to host in 2020. It was late 2018, and I was by that time Chief Secretary to the Treasury, charged with keeping a tight grip on public spending across government, which an estimated price tag of over £200 million. I strongly questioned whether organising this jamboree should be a priority for the government. I was in a minority of one yet again. We were in the midst of the fraught Brexit negotiations, and I thought the last thing the UK needed was to host tens of thousands of delegates at an international shindig that was bound to create more hot air than genuine environmental solutions. From the reaction of my colleagues, you would have thought I had just suggested napalming the Brazilian rainforest. As a former environment secretary, I was more than familiar with the global challenge of climate change and the need to reduce carbon emissions. But I also knew there were no quick wins to be had on the issue. Had I believed the conference was likely to make any difference, I might have been more sympathetic. But I could see no prospect of that. World leaders would fly in on private jets to pontificate about the environment and reaffirm their aspirations to reduce emissions, while the biggest culprits would continue to do nothing. More than anything, bidding for COP26 was about appeasing the green lobby by making a grand gesture aimed at gaining short-term popularity without changing the fundamentals. It was environmental virtue signalling, with the taxpayer picking up the hefty bill. We had seen too much of this government over the years. But the rest of the cabinet was in the grip of climate fever. When they weren't posing for selfies with Greta Thunberg, they were busy trying to ban wood-burning stoves and plastic straws. After David Cameron's hug a husky phase, during which he literally went to the Arctic and hugged a dog for the cameras before zealously courting the Green Lobby, We'd done nothing to reverse Labour's statinist climate change policies. One of my campaigns as a constituency MP was a major expansion of the A11, which got built in 2015. The project had been hugely delayed and the price massively hiked by the, all the environmental objections and works. In particular, the builders had been forced to install bat bridges, so bats could travel safely across the road. Needless to say, no bat has ever been seen on these bridges. Anyway, bats fly. When Cameron came to see the new road being built, he bemoaned all the nonsense that had led to increased costs. It was just another example of how no one, not even the Prime Minister, could stop the environmental juggernaut. In turn, by the end of Prime Minister Theresa May's government in 2019, we had committed ourselves to building climate change targets with very little discussion of their consequences. The environmental debate is the single greatest example over the last three decades of Conservatives losing the argument to the left. We have dumped costs on families with no regard for whether they can afford them and we have failed to plan for the long term. Meanwhile, there is little discernible impact on overall environmental outcomes. Many programmes such as the SWIFT from petrol to diesel in cars or the use of electric vehicles, have either harmed the environment in other ways or empowered our polluting adversaries elsewhere in the world by making us dependent on important gas and coal and Chinese solar panels. Big corporations, central bankers and other cynical actors in the global establishment have latched on to tackling climate change as a way of seeking subsidies as well as buffing up their image. This is not just harmless virtue signalling, it has provided an excuse for not taking a tougher stance on global aggressors like China. It has also damaged our economic competitiveness and disproportionately affected people on the lowest incomes with all manner of environmental taxes and costs incurred from regulations. This is all out of step with what the public want. The backlash against the ultra-low emission zone, the ULEZ, implemented by Mayor of London Sadiq Khan, 
under which older cars are subject to a punitive daily charge for being driven anywhere in Greater London, demonstrates what happens when grandiose objectives come into contact with the reality of hard-pressed people who have to drive to work or take the kids to school. While there are serious issues with the environment, the level of alarmism and ever-increasing rhetoric is not enabling a healthy and proportionately debate to take place. There are also ludicrous claims that pursuing a net zero agenda, defined as seeking a 100% reduction of greenhouse gas by 2050 compared with 1990 levels, will boost the economy and drive growth. This is patently not true and wishful thinking. Additionally, environmental regulations have already hampered growth. For example, the National Grid estimates a cost of £3 trillion for decarbonising the electricity system. And the opportunity cost of not fracking and not fully using our North Sea gas reserves is immense. According to some estimates, the UK could be fully self-sufficient in gas, which would allow us to bring our price down to US levels. The zealous drive to net zero is undeniably making business less competitive, hitting taxpayers uh, through the cost of additional subsidies and hiking energy bills for consumers and industry alike, all of which is acting as a drag on economic growth. Yet the adoption of new global objectives has allowed local resistance to schemes such as London's ULES to be circumvented. <coughs> More decisions have been outsourced to international authorities and courts that are fundamentally anti-democratic. This unstoppable bandwagon has continued regardless of who has been in office. Much of this was still going on while that noted sceptic of the eco-agenda Donald Trump was leader of the free world. Trump withdrew the US from the 2015 Paris Climate Accords, which committed all 195 signed-up nations to reducing emissions of greenhouse gases. Although the lengthy process of withdrawal spanned most of his presidency before it came into effect, his decision found little international support, with Theresa May even publicising that she had telephoned him to express her disappointment. Needless to say, Biden reversed the decision the very day he took office. In the UK, the Climate Change Committee was established by the 2008 Climate Change Act passed by the Labour government, legislation that has been reversed or not been reversed or reformed by the Conservatives. This committee advises the government on achieving net zero emissions through all manner of methods, including limiting the eating of meat and stopping new airports. We have adopted an approach of unilateral economic disarrangement. As dangerous as to our strategic interests as unilateral nuclear disarmament would have been in the 1980s. A focus solely on climate change at the expense of other issues has meant vital national interests like food security and energy security have been ignored. It's a situation that is belatedly and partly being righted only as a result of Vladimir Putin's invasion of Ukraine, which threatened our food and natural gas supplies. In our haste to not be seen as on the wrong side of history, we fail to make conservative arguments for environmental improvement, arguments centred on the property rights, individual and family endeavours, and the free market. Instead, we empowered our ideological opponents and accepted much of their extremist agenda. The environmental movement is fundamentally driven by the radical left. I know who these people are. I literally grew up with them. My parents were members of the Campaign for Nuclear Disarmament, the CND, in the 1980s and had friends who were in the Ecological Party, an early iteration of the Green Party. As a child, it seemed all about beetroot tarts compositing toilets, and talking about the dangers of overpopulation. The movement has its roots in the late 1960s, amid idealistic notions about rejecting the market economy, going back to nature, and living in self-sufficient communes. This fused with other trends on the new left, such as pacifism, nuclear disarmament, and militant feminism. This watermelon tendency is green on the outside, red on the inside a modern rebranding of socialism. 
It features the same instincts of collectivism and authoritarianism. This has traditionally been expressed by advocating the redistribution of wealth, the imposition of higher taxes and bigger government. But environmentalism has provided a potent new outlet for these instincts, with anti-capitalist campaigners jumping on the bandwagon. The new left in both the UK and the US evolved from trade unions representing organised labour into a cultural movement that represents so-called progressive values. Environmental politics has now been shaped into an integral part of that agenda, which sets itself up as a fierce critic of conservative values, free market economics, and pretty much the entire basis of capitalism. It fits with the broader worldview that became prominent on the left during the Cold War, that the Soviet Union was somehow morally superior, or at least equivalent to the US, and that all the evils of the world originated in the West. There's an element of self-loathing in this mi mindset that we can readily identify on the left. Capitalism, they believe, is the cause of all our problems, and the industrialised West must therefore be punished for its success by adopting punitive measures as a form of retribution. The hand-wringing liberal guilt associated with this narrative has shaped the debate on green issues. The environmentalist worldview has become mainstream. It is now the dominant ideology in major corporations, media on both sides of the Atlantic, including the BBC, and the legal establishment. There are also cynical motivations for those who espouse it, or should I say espouse it. Many have embraced it as a way of making money after politics or officialdom, whereby they can rake in cash and appear virtuous, of course, it was also loved and embraced by government employees. Although civil servants are supposed to be impartial, one can always sense the level of enthusiasm among them for particular policies. Tackling climate change was certainly pursued with a lot of more fervour by officials than stopping the boats that have brought tens of thousands of illegal migrants to British shores. Historically, there is no basis whatsoever for the belief that protecting the environment should be a left-wing cause. During the 1980s, it was none other than Margaret Thatcher who first raised climate control as a global priority and pushed for the Montreal Protocol, which banned chlorofluorocarbons chemicals to reverse damage to the ozone layer. And it was the Soviet Union that was one of the worst environmental polluters in the world and responsible for the Chernobyl disaster. Today, of course, the accolade for the worst polluter goes to communist China. I believe it is wrong that a company can be responsible for pollution, have a negative impact on the health of other people, and the nearby environment have not have to pay for it. But I support a free market approach to these issues, which in economic terms involves internalising extremities. If you're causing a pollution, you should pay for it. Once a framework has been set with the right rules and prices, we can let companies get on with going about their business and making money. When I was appointed environmental secretary in 2014, my first cabinet role, I saw it as an opportunity to address environmental concerns from a free market perspective. This was easier said than done. The department and its officials had been hijacked by a watermelon-oriented non-government organisation, the NGOs, it became apparent that in order to be deemed up to the job, you had to pass an environmental purity test. The NGOs saw themselves as gatekeepers and airbiters at the department. As a result, it was sometimes hard to tell where the officials on the payroll ended and the activists began. Many civil servants saw it as their job to work for the sector, a word that always made me nervous. Usually, it meant that the department felt it in hock to the particular vested interests which they were dealing. This was either because they generally agreed with them, or just because serving them and getting along made for an easier life. Similar relationships with external stakeholders mean that it is true in many government departments. The ministers who are supposed to run these departments often see their jobs as being representatives of their sectors in the cabinet. 
The Education Secretary is expected to speak up for teachers, the Health Secretary to speak up on behalf of the NHS, and so on. At the department responsible for the environment, it meant being expected to speak up for the farmers and the environmental movement. By contrast, I was clear that my job was to speak up for the wider public interest, which was not always the same thing. Campaign groups like Friends of the Earth, Greenpeace, and the Worldwide Fund for Nature are highly adept at lobbying and channeling public sympathy towards their agendas. Many of them have huge resources from their membership income and donations. Most of their supporters contribute their hard-earned cash under the innocent belief that they are merely supporting a cute animal charity. They have little idea just how much of their money is being channeled into lobbying the government on tangential issues. All these groups spend a lot of time not only with each other, but also with NGOs and sympathetic officials, meaning that groupthink becomes inevitable. The, co the consensus that develops on what is and is not desirable then becomes difficult to oppose, particularly when you are dealing with organisations that are all too willing to mobilise that campaign machinery to whip up a firestorm of public protest to exert pressure on MPs and ministers. Their campaigns are incessant, often highly misleading, and can lead to preserve and damaging outcomes. An example on my watch was the successful campaign to ban the use of neon tectonoids as a uh, pesticide in farming. The chemical was considered harmful to bees, and the European Union consequently banned it from use on a number of crops in 2013. In 2015, I authorised an emergency application for the limited use of some neurocarnitinides by farmers who re rapeseed crops were at risk of destruction from beetles. This prompted a huge outcry, including protesters dressed up as bumblebees entering Downing Street. MPs' inboxes were inundated with emails, the panic resulted in the Prime Minister backing down. The result was that the ban remained in place, while farmers ended up losing or using more harmful chemicals and crops were lost. The animal rights activists I encountered made these environmentalists look reasonable by comparison. These people sought to intimidate, bully, and do damage pure and simple. Tactics that, regrettably, the most aggressive eco-campaigners have also begun to do and adopt in recent years. It was no coincidence they wore the outfits of criminals, clad in balaclavas, when they sought to protest against and disrupt essential operations that the department had sanctioned. They were, frankly, some most robust officials who had ever been at the department longer and were enforced by veterinary advisors and scientists. They were more practical and hard-nosed about the realities of farming and the countryside. It was on their advice that I found myself making slightly surreal life-and-death decisions about the natural world, such as ordering the, uh, the gassing of 5,000 ducks in Yorkshire during an outbreak of avian flu. The most contentious animal rights issue was the badger cull, the necessary trapping and shooting of wild badgers that had been spreading bovine tuberculosis, a disease that was lethal for dairy and beef cattle, Distraught farmers had been losing herds for years because of this terrible disease. There were no other realistic options to stop the spread apart from culling the badgers. Yet it was hugely politically contentious, with a host of high-profile, well-funded objectors as well as some very willy saboteurs who had to be outwitted. I was condemned by Queen guitarist uh, Brian May, and at one point, the protesters travelled around Parliament Square with a mini badger coffin with a toy badger inside. They were successful at influencing corporations, getting the coffee shop chain Cafe Nero to boycott milk from farms that were participating in the cull. The objectors relentlessly used the tools created for open government to hound the people carrying out this important work. They pursued us through the courts. Transparency laws meant that they could find out where the coal was taking place and intimidate the farmers. I was constantly consulting with lawyers, thereby adding to the taxpayer's bill. As well as dealing with the politics, 
there were the practical issues about getting the coal done during a limited time window. I got involved in everything from the bait being used, peanut butter and maize worked best to motivating the shooters who had to go out late at night. The start of the coal in 2014 coincided with the annual Conservative Party conference in Birmingham because I am a cheapskate, I had booked myself into a capsule hotel. Little did I know that I would be required to give a pep talk to Gloucestershire shooters over a walkie-talkie from there. I didn't think the muscular ex-marine who was leading the coal quite believed it when he asked to sit in this tiny room with me and two special advisors as I shouted bellicose rhetoric down the walkie-talkie. Go out there and deliver. You can do it. This is important for the country. We need to foil the saboteurs and get this done. I later learned that the call was, in fact, being followed in high places. At the Royal Garden Party in Buckingham Palace the following year, the then Duke of Edinburgh, Prince Philip, congratulated me on actually getting the job done. These animal calls were necessary to tackle very real threats from the spread of disease, but the animal rights activists were absolutists, they simply didn't care. The excess of the animal rights lobby can be hugely disruptive. While the majority of their funders and supporters care about animal welfare, most also accept there has to be a balance struck between the humane treatment of animals on the one hand and the need to support agriculture and give people the choice to eat meat on the other. In my own constituency in southwest Norfolk, I had to intervene to help pig farmers who were being targeted by vegan campaigners. The farmers had been facing ongoing problems getting their pigs into Norfolk markets. We simply cannot allow this kind of obstruction to be normalised. Farmers have a right to go about their business and conservatives need to be firm in pushing back against this kind of activism. Every time a conservative appeases this lobby, for example by saying we should eat less meat or switch to non-dairy alternatives, they are giving succour to our opponents. Representing one of the best farming areas in Britain, with pigs, poultry and arable land, I was determined that the agricultural industry, vital for food, security and also our economy, should thrive. Yet it was clear that farming was seen by too many as a nice-to-have, meaning it was subordinated to environmental goals. I was also frustrated that as a country, we weren't prouder of the food we produce and were not grasping its potential for growth. In nations like Ireland and New Zealand, Dairy farmers are a major contributor to the economy and have become serious industries that export their wares around the world. By contrast, in Britain, it seemed we are no longer in caring about how much we produce in agriculture. We have a lot to be proud of in terms of the quality of our food production. I felt as Environment Secretary, and I still feel that, we needed to do much better at promoting British food both at home and abroad. Food and farming in the UK contribute around £120 billion to the economy and employ over 4 million people, which is far from insignificant. But there is still a huge amount of untapped potential. In seizing the opportunities presented by Brexit, we should be looking to grow and maximise our exports into new world markets. Farming is a great part of Britain's heritage, and it should be a big part of our economic future too. I am a big proponent of genetic modification, which enables farmers to achieve better yields using fewer pesticides and less water. Yet again, the Green Movement was against this technology, despite the fact that it enabled farmers to produce food in a way that has less impact on the planet. They also objected to trade, I wanted trade deals to secure more opportunities for British farmers and business overseas. I visited the US to meet Tom Vilsack, Secretary of Agriculture in the Obama administration, to talk about the transatlantic trade and investment partnership, the proposed Europe-US trade deal. Yet the reaction in the UK was simply to slam the Americans for washing chicken with chlorine to protect against disease and injecting beef with hormones despite the fact that hundreds of thousands of Britons visit the US every year and merrily devour flavoursome steaks and chicken wings. Their attitude towards trade reflected the same mixture of snobbery and self-loathing at which the left are specialists. 
It is fitting that the left-wing activists who adopted a radical interpretation of environmentalism were often the same people campaigning for unilateral nuclear disarmament. In many ways, the manner in which the debate over climate change has developed over time has followed the same self-defeating -defe logic. Most people will agree that in an ideal world, we would want to reduce the number of nuclear weapons. The divide is between a rational belief in working towards multilateral disarmament by agreement and that misguided naivety of those who think that unilateral disarmament will magically prompt other countries to do the same. Of course, taking the unilateral route would leave us defenseless against enemies who have no intention of disarming. In the same way, most people will agree with the objective of reducing carbon emissions to tackle climate change. But while the West has adopted stringent targets for reducing carbon emissions and pledged itself to net zero emissions over time, China has carried on building more and more coal-fired power stations. Nothing the West does can be effective while this is the case. Meanwhile, we are ourselves contributing to the problem by outsourcing more industrial production to Chinese factories which in turn are causing more pollution while being subject to no penalties. We have also ended up dangerously dependent on Chinese solar panels amid our push for more renewable energy. Effectively, all we have done is to outsource our carbon emissions to China. Having visited Chinese cities like Shanghai, Shanghai and Beijing and seen the levels of pollution there, I know that little of the rhetoric I heard from the Chinese environment minister about their strict environmental policies was being enacted. We know their numbers can't be trusted because this is a totalitarian regime with little transparency. The truth is that China, Russia and Iran are prioritising the expansion of their totalitarian regimes, not tackling climate change. What this means in practice is that we are in the West are trying our hands behind our backs by not using our natural resources and accepting huge additional costs to move to lower carbon technologies, while our rivals are busy exploiting the strategic advantage given to them by our unilateral disarmament. This is another parallel to the Cold War. Just as the Soviet Union exploited the disruptive efforts of the CND and other left-wing movements to destabilise Western governments, so too are China and Russia benefiting from the efforts of green activists. In the UK and Europe, Russia has funded anti-fracking campaigns and spread disinformation as a way of keeping Europeans hooked on Russian gas. They have also funded anti-fracking campaigns in the US. We cannot treat the issue of climate change as though it exists independently of the wider challenges we face and the geopolitical realities of the world. And until we take China seriously, we will not be taking or tackling climate change seriously either. Instead of fighting shy and pretending the Chinese are our partners in this global endeavour, we should call it as it is and attack them as the world's leader polluter. Western countries should then use the levers we have at our disposal to penalise them economically. That means presenting a united front to give them worse terms of trade unless they change their behaviour. In the meantime, we need to be realistic about what we can achieve by unilateral action. We should benchmark ourselves against other G7 countries and be honest about the limits of that action and the costs of it. We need to focus squarely on the real culprits and stop the nonsensical gesture politics such as local councils declaring climate emergencies, without any plan to take meaningful action. I support using a combination of nuclear energy, renewables and exploiting our own oil and natural gas, including fracking, which is currently banned in the UK. This is not simply an environmental issue, it will have direct economic benefits as well as both securing our supply and reducing our vulnerability to shocks such as we have seen in recent years. My environmental credentials go back many years. I made a speech to the Liberal Democrat Conference in 1993 when I was a member of that party in my youth, attacking the then party leader Paddy Ashdown for being a hypocrite on the issue of wind farms. He had spoken of his support for them while simultaneously opposing a wind farm development in his constituency near Yeovil in Somerset. 
After the speech, he called me into a meeting and tried to pacify me by telling me we were on the same side. I gave him short shrift and he later wrote me a letter telling me I was utterly fearless in not backing down. It was my first taste of how politicians would emote about the environment without being prepared to carry out the policy. I feel the same about how conservatives during the last days of Theresa May's premiership legislated for net zero carbon emissions by 2050 without any accompanying plan to achieve it. The switch to renewables is a huge undertaking for which our current national infrastructure is unprepared. The electricity grid is currently configured around former power stations, not offshore wind or places where small modular reactors might be sited. Nor can the intimate and expensive nature of wind power be solved just by building more of it. Changing that configuration is a massive challenge. But for politicians across the spectrum, it's been a case of legislate first and worry about the consequences later. That is not a serious way of doing business. Instead, Britain should aim to be energy independent by 2040 using oil and gas as well as nuclear and renewables. We are in an excellent position to become a net zero energy exporter. Given the amount of sea by which we are surrounded where offshore wind farms can be located, as well as our expertise in nuclear power. The use of North Sea oil and gas is critical, so there needs to be investment in that too. There also should be fracking in the UK. We are in the ludicrous position of importing fracked gas from the US that is being liquefied to minus 180 degrees Celsius, but refusing to frack ourselves. Meanwhile, Brits are paying twice as much for their energy as Americans. In order to cut costs for our citizens and boost our energy security, we must have the courage to do what is required for the long term, rather than chase virtue signalling headlines. We need affordable energy to improve people's standards of living, make our businesses more competitive and boost our economy. As a Conservative, I believe strongly in protecting our natural environment without action. We will harm our quality of life and the planet. A conservative agenda and economic growth are dependent on a healthy environment. But we should not be sidetracked into gesture politics for the sake of short-term kudos from the predominantly left-wing green lobby. Just as in education, conservatives must remain on their guard against the left's persistence capturing of the agenda. It should not be a surprise to us that leftists believe that environmental policies must take the form of higher taxes, burdensome regulations, and industrial subsidiaries. Those are, after all, all their responses to every policy challenge. In response, we on the right need to be equally assertive in highlighting alternatives that focus on maximising the economic opportunities available, increasing our competitive advantage and growth in the economy. We need to take on the pernicious uh, degrowth ideology. This means challenging those who think population shrinkage and the limiting of human ambition are the answers. All these people are doing is damaging the future of the West and aiding our opponents. The best way to protect the environment is through property rights, not collectivism. Because when you give people ownership of something, it gives them a sense of responsibility. We should have no tolerance for anti-capitalist activities. Exploiting legitimate environmental concerns to pursue their leftist agenda, it's time conservatives fought back against the watermelons and called them out for the damage they're doing. It is not just the eco-warriors gluing themselves to the road and blocking traffic who need to be quashed. It is also the more respectable sounding advocates of damaging economic policies who have glued themselves to the political agenda and need to be prized off. In the geopolitics of today, we should also always be alive to the fact that our obsession with the environment virtual signalling on the world stage risks putting us at a further disadvantage in the economic battle with our opponents, China, Russia and other authoritarian regimes, which will not be shamed into going green. And it's even less likely that they will be somehow inspired by our example into an altruistic conversion. They will merely take full advantage of the economic restrictions we are placing on ourselves to grow even stronger. 
in order to make ourselves more competitive after Brexit, we in the UK should have streamlined our regulations. But instead, governments here and all across the West have been adding to the burden. And in the case of environmental regulations, the result has been that we have merely pushed pollution elsewhere while inflicting damage on ourselves. We should recognise that this is not just about preserving the planet, it is also about saving and improving the lives of the people who live on it. We cannot do that if we lose sight of the wider challenges and fail to tackle the other real threats to people's freedom and well-being. The number one threat to the environment and our freedom and security is the rise of authoritarian regimes and the decline of democracy. Therefore, we need to cancel failed multilateral structures and work with allies that share our values. We should cancel the COP gravy train, which simply provides an arena for lobbyists to make money and countries to try to greenwash their reputations. If there is a global agreement on carbon emissions to be had, it can only work if every country agrees. There is no chance of this with the bad actors we have today. It's much better these policies are managed at a national state level. We should abolish the Climate Change Act and instead adopt a new Climate Freedom Act that enables rather than dictates technology. The US should reverse the Inflation Reduction Act and the EU should abandon its equivalent measures, instead of subsidising that which makes us less competitive and hurts our allies. We should be competing to achieve the best technological advances. The US, along with its allies like the UK and G7, and other leading nations should work together through an economic NATO to agree on a coordinated approach to the polluters like China. This should be done in conjunction with tackling other problems such as the use of slave labour, intellectual property violations and the undemanding of freedom and democracy. In the UK, we should protect our environment by protecting property rights allowing enterprise to develop new green technologies, protecting existing technologies like genetic modification, and removing bans on imports provided the food supply is kept safe. We should call out the green lobby's brazen anti-capitalist agenda. They are the extremists in today's politics and should be labelled as such. They say they want to reduce carbon but oppose nuclear power. They say they want less pesticide use but oppose genetic modification. They organised their protests on iPhones, devices that came into existence through free markets. We also have to wrest back control of environmental policy from the legions of bureaucrats. Ultimately, these decisions should be made by politicians who have to answer to the people.